<laughs> it can be extremely challenging to move abroad as a single, young adult. You might feel less nervous, however, if you are an au pair. In general, hiring an au pair is a positive experience for both the au pair and the hiring family. Au pairs have the chance to embrace a new culture, improve their language skills. If they move to a country where a foreign language is spoken, they can make friends and gain independence. Au pairs usually range in age from 18 to 30. In exchange for childcare and some household chores, families provide an au pair with a room, meals, and a small wage to spend in their spare time. This is a great way to spend a year if you're unsure what to do after school and want to travel. Perhaps you just need some time to yourself. Once you're connected with a family, everything is arranged in terms of housing and employment. It can, of course, be a disaster as well. As does moving to a foreign country and staying with a family you don't know or inviting someone you've never met in person into your home. True crime fans know all too well that appearances can be deceptive. Basically, au pairing requires a high level of trust from both parties. The experience of becoming an au pair has turned into a living nightmare for a young woman who will not survive it. And this is the story of this girl. In Southfield, southwest London, firefighters attended Sabrina Kuider in Wisa Medini's home on the 20th of September, 2017, after receiving complaints that a foul-smelling bonfire had been set in the back garden. Residents were right to be concerned about the bonfire, it was on the verge of burning out of control. At the nearby barbecue, Kuider and Medini were cooking chicken. It appeared they were unconcerned about the raging flames just feet away. Following the fire's extinguishment, firefighters made a gruesome discovery. They asked Medini what he was burning, and he calmly replied that it was the carcass of a sheep he had bought in Wimbledon Market. One of the first firefighters to arrive at the scene, Thomas Hunt, reported seeing what he thought were human fingers and noses burning. As he began sifting through the ash, he discovered blackened pieces of clothing and jewelry. Hunt's suspicions would prove to be correct. Rather than sheep bones, the bonfire contained the remains of Sophie Lionel Medini and Kuider's 21-year-old French au pair. Apparently, Medini dismissed the discovery of the charred remains of a French nanny in his garden with a calm demeanor as if to say, the game's over, I'm caught. Sophie Lyonnais was born on the 7th of January 1996 in Tra, in northeast France, to Catherine de Vallon and Patrick Lyonnais, Catherine and Patrick divorced at some point, and Catherine married Stéphane de Vallon, Sophie's stepfather. But Sophie was very close to them both even after they divorced. Sophia had long, dark curls, greenish-gray eyes, and a kind, warm smile. Known for her quiet, gentle nature, love for animals, and desire to work with children, she dreamed of becoming a teacher. Sophie's mother, Catherine, described her as someone who hated suffering and injustice. She was passionate about preventing animal cruelty. Sophie was a selfless and generous person, who was never particularly interested in material possessions, Upon finishing school, Sophie completed a vocational course in childcare. Soon after, she was hired as an au pair in London. London is an entirely different world from her hometown. For Sophie, it is an adventure. While she may have been a little apprehensive, it would be a great chance for her to stretch her wings and get out of her comfort zone. In addition, she would significantly improve her English. Additionally, she would gain experience for her future career while working with children. A nervous but excited Sophie moved to London after her 20th birthday in January 2016. Little did she know what she would encounter. Sabrina Kuider, born 1983, and Wiesem Sam Medini, born 1978, were French nationals, living on Wimbledon Park Road in Southfields, a district in southwest London located within the borough of Wandsworth. As a child, Kuider moved to France from Algeria. At the age of 19, she operated a crepe stand at a fun fair on the outskirts of Paris when she met 24-year-old Medouni. She immediately captivated Medouni with her beauty and charm. In no time, she had him wrapped around her little finger when he became obsessed with her. 
Kuhider cheated on Meduni and left him for other men regularly, demonstrating his manipulation and disloyalty. Despite this, she always returned to him, and he took her back without question. In 2005, at the age of 22, Kuider left France for London, for a job as an au pair. As a 27-year-old, Meduni got a job as a financial analyst at Société Générale in London. With Meduni's job in finance and Kuider's success as a fashion designer and makeup artist, the pair made good money. Their flat in Southfields was worth £900,000. The couple had two children, though I found very little information about them during my research, other than the fact that they were boys aged 8 and 4 when this story takes place. Kuider had at least one boy from a previous relationship. The father of her youngest child was her ex-boyfriend, Mark Walton. Kuider and Meduni were referred to as antisocial and odd by their neighbors. They said Sabrina Kuider always dressed well and looked very glamorous. The couple was not friendly, and often ignored those who lived around them by leaving their garbage outside their home for days, blocking neighbors' driveways with their cars, and not paying their landlord on time. Sophie's experience as an au pair for Kuider and Meduni began positively. The children adored her, and she was in her element taking care of them. She became friends with other nannies working in the area, of which there were many. Sophie seemed pleased with how things were going in her early phone calls with her mother, Catherine. She and Sabrina Kuider got along well. They often chatted over cups of tea at the kitchen table. Kuider, who loved doing hair and makeup, even gave Sophie a makeover once. Despite that, Sophie's initial phase of happiness and ease in her new job would not last. It's difficult to pinpoint exactly when things began to get worse. Sabrina Kuider's ex-boyfriend and father of her baby, Mark Walton, had a hold on her that was so baffling. It is true to say that her obsession with this man is stranger than fiction. Here is something that you need to keep in mind for a short while. Boyzone was formed in 1993 by Irish music manager Lou Walsh. If you watch The X Factor, you probably know him. Walton joined Boyzone as a founding member, but was pushed out after about a year by his fellow band members. Walton would not have been a part of the band when it became very successful in the UK. When this story takes place, Walton lives in Los Angeles and works in the music industry. The relationship between Walton and Kuider lasted from 2011 to 2013. Several months after Sophie arrived in London and started working as an au pair for Kuider and Meduni, Kuider began exhibiting severe delusional behavior. The delusions revolved around an absurd obsession with the idea that her 21-year-old French au pair was working with Mark Walton to harm her and the family. Walton had never met Sophie in her life. Kuider's rage towards Walton may have originated from a bad breakup, or perhaps from the thought that he might gain custody of their child. Calling and accusing him of sexual abuse of her cat was something bizarre, because she did not have one. In addition, she asserted that he used black magic on her and had a helicopter fly over her home and spy on her. Kuider filed more than 30 false reports about Walton, all of which turned out to be false. Among Kuider's accusations against Sophie were her sleeping with Walton and helping him come into her home to drug and sexually assault Kuider and the children. Kuider and Midani are thought to have suffered from a rare condition of madness or schizophrenia. Kuider was previously diagnosed with depression and borderline personality disorder. She manipulated Medini into sharing her delusions on top of these existing psychological disorders. Meduni was completely on board with anything Kuider said or did. At a psychiatric evaluation Meduni was not found to have any mental health issues, but he fully agreed with Kuider's accusation against Mark Walton. As Kuider's violent behavior towards Sophie was just beginning Meduni would leave the flat and go for a walk instead of joining in the abuse. Soon, however, he began participating in Kuider's outrageous stories including that Sophie was bringing Walton into their home so that he could sexually assault him. In the months preceding her murder, several members of the Southfields community remembered seeing Sophie out. However, she did not speak to people she did not know well, since she was shy and didn't speak much English. Michael Cromer, 
a fish restaurant owner in the area and a potential business partner of the couple, later spoke to the press about Sophie. Sophie occasionally joined the couple for dinner at Cromer's, but she didn't say much. She did, however, come in a few times on her own, and one time she was clearly upset. Cromer asked her what was wrong, and she replied that her mother was really ill. In response to the question of why didn't Sophie just leave her employer's house, Sophie said she had written and spoken to her family about leaving. In any case, it seemed likely that the pair had manipulated her and gained control over her. Approximately 15 months into Catherine's employment, she noticed her daughter seemed unhappy and fed up with her life every single time they spoke. Sophie actually told Catherine she wanted to go home. Catherine booked a flight ticket for her daughter since she was not being paid and had no money. However, Sophie has not returned. The investigators never found Sophie's passport or the airplane ticket her mother had bought for her after searching Kuwaiter and Medunee's home after her murder. Catherine recalled her daughter crying and sounding disoriented during a phone call on the 8th of August, 2017. Sophie was beaten, no longer being paid, and being interrogated regularly at that point. Kuwaiter and Meduni were not allowing her to eat, so she had become fragile. Sophie was not allowed to leave her flat on Wimbledon Park Road for the final 12 days before her murder. When firefighters were called to a flat on the 20th of September, 2017, they found a barbecue on a bonfire, so Kuwaiter and Meduni were arrested on suspicion of murder two days later. Wisa Mudini, 40, and Sabrina Kuwaiter, 34, are standing trial at London's Old Bailey for the murder of Sophie Lyonnais. Apparently, the two tried to dispose of the au pair's body. Both admitted it. However, when it came to pointing fingers at each other for her murder, both refused to accept responsibility. Richard Horwell QC, Queen's Counsel, for those outside the UK, prosecuted Mudini and Kuwaiter. Horwell recounted to the jury the horrific abuse Sophie endured in the final months of her life at the hands of her employers, who motivated their actions as punishment and revenge against Mark Walton. It was a nightmare at home for Sophie. Howell told the jury Kuwaiter's accusations against Walton were pure fantasy. When it came to women, Meduni was a weak, submissive, pliable individual who outperformed his weight, as evidenced by his relationship with Kuwaiter. Horwell described how the naive and shy Sophie Lyonnais was helpless against a manipulative and abusive person like Sabrina Kuwaiter. Sophie was not only young, but also naive and highly vulnerable, making her an easy target for abuse and exploitation. She was easily broken down by their vicious and relentless interrogations, which involved beatings and holding her head underwater in the bathtub. Sophie was eventually forced to confirm that Kuwaiter's deranged accusations were true, that she was conspiring to have Mark Walton come to their home so he could drug them and sexually assault them. In case she didn't confess, she was threatened with rape, violence, and imprisonment. The jury was shown a video of Sophie confessing on the 18th of September, 2017. In the video, she appears emaciated and completely broken. Sophie died shortly after the video was taken, Orwell said. You had seen Sophie state in that video clip when she uttered those last words, and whatever else may be said about that final confession, it is anything but voluntary. Horwell described the defendant's actions as a campaign of intimidation, torture, and violence that left the young woman crushed. More than eight hours of recordings of these interrogations were found on the cell phones of Kuwaiter and Meduni. One of the recordings from the 11th of September, Nine days before the murder, recorded Kuwaiter screaming at Sophie, You destroy everything. I was trying to find myself again. I pray to God not to make me touch you. I don't want to get dirty. Before her body was thrown onto the bonfire, Sophie was the victim of significant violence from the evil couple. She suffered a fractured jawbone, sternum, and five broken ribs. Ultimately, Sophie's body was burned on a bonfire in the defendant's backyard to cover up the murder. They were grilling chicken next to the bonfire where they were burning their victim's body. The fire was extinguished, and the burnt debris was turned over with a spade to ensure that the fire had been fully extinguished. As the ash was turned, Sophie's remains began to appear. 
they plan to tell how Sophie left their employment out of the blue and returned to France. At trial, home office pathologists said the body's gender and age were unclear at first because of how badly burned it was. It wasn't until two weeks later, on the 3rd of October, that a DNA test confirmed that the body was Sophie's. There was no final determination of her cause of death, a blow to the head, strangulation, or drowning are the most likely causes. From Los Angeles to London, Mark Walton flew to testify in Sabrina Kuiter's case. During his testimony, he stated that he and Kuiter had been together for two years and deeply in love with her. She was, however, extremely unpredictable and volatile. He never knew when she would snap and start screaming at him. He also added that he hired several nannies, but she continuously fired them paranoid they were stealing from her and flirting with him. And when asked about his relationship with Sophie Lyonnais, he said never, ever, heard of her or ever talked to her. Medini's initial statement at trial was that Sophie died by accident while he interrogated her in the bathtub. He later retracted this, saying he only said this to protect Kuiter. It was Kuiter who woke him up by telling him that Sophie was not breathing. He got up and found her in the bath. As Kuiter told him, she was not breathing. In her defense statement, Kuiter said Sophie died while she slept. The prosecution was successful in convincing the jury of Sabrina Kuiter and Wiesem Medini's guilt. After a two-month trial, the pair were found guilty of the murder of Sophie Lyonnais on the 24th of May, 2018. Kuiter burst into tears after hearing the verdict. Medini sat motionless, staring into his lap. After their conviction, Sophie's mother told the press they starved, tortured, and broke her until she could no longer fight. They took away her dignity and finally her life. These people are self-obsessed monsters. Sabrina and Wiesem have not only robbed my daughter of her life so brutally and without remorse, but also stolen mine. A letter of apology from Kuiter to Sophie and her family was read out during the sentencing hearing. The letter said, Dear Sophie, May peace be with you. First of all, I wish everyone, including Sophie, especially her parents and family who are suffering badly, to know how deeply sorry I am for what happened to Sophie. We shared many good times together and pains until things went terribly wrong, and it ended up in this horrendous tragedy. I think of you every day, and I am shocked and sad that you are not part of this world anymore. It feels like a horrible dream to me that I wish I could just wake up from. Every day I live with sadness and sorrow. I am suffering every day thinking of you and what happened to you that dreadful night. I only wish I could turn the clock back so that it never happened and you would still be alive with us today. I will now live without hope and I can't even imagine ever being happy again. I struggle every day and I am very disappointed in myself. Sophie, I wish things could have been different and I hope you rest in peace with God. With the deepest regret. Sabrina Kuiter To gain leniency, Kuiter's lawyer explained that her actions were caused by delusions and personality disorders, which left her with an irrational and completely overwhelming fear that Sophie was conspiring against her family with Mark Walton. He said her behavior towards the victim was entirely driven by Kuiter's mental illness and her desperation to obtain evidence of Walton's abuse. Judge Nicholas Hilliard believed the parents were severely delusional, especially Kuiter, and that this was no defense for their cruel treatment and eventual murder of their timid and vulnerable au pair. Hilliard turned and faced Kuiter and met a knee and said, in the days leading up to Sophie's death, both of you tortured her in the bath by telling her she would drown if she did not give you the information she was not able to give because it never existed. She suffered and was tortured for a long time before she died, with no mercy shown. He finished by saying, I do not think you thought for one moment you were acting lawfully. I'm sure you knew the way you interrogated her was unacceptable in the extreme, that it was unlawful to assault her, and she was in a dreadful state by the time of her death, and torturing her in the bath was totally and utterly wrong. 
Kuwaiter and Medini were both sentenced to life in prison to serve a minimum of 30 years. No one, no God will ever forgive them both for what they have done to Sophie. They are equally as evil as one another,